We're on. Hello, this is State Representative Rob Martwick, and I'm coming to you with another one of my series of uh, Facebook Live videos. For those of you uh, who haven't seen these before, I, I do these videos as a way of trying to inform you about the job that I do, the issues that I face, the way that we approach our problems. And it's, it's meant to be educational for you because most of this job is educational for me as I learn about our issues. Uh, today I had uh, the opportunity to attend a legislative breakfast that was put on by the Alliance of Homeless Advocates, um, AHAND, um, and Alliance of Homeless Advocates. So this was a large group of people, a large group of legislators and advocates that talked about the homeless issue in Illinois and the things that the advocates are doing to try and um, address homelessness and, and housing shortages and uh, provide housing for people, stability for people, services to people, and how their interaction is with the government, what we're doing that's working, and what we're not doing and what's not working. And, and this is an idea to, to try and have an interactive dialogue to help solve some problems. So I heard from dozens of speakers today and it was, it was really fascinating. I, I learned a lot. Um, but there were two speakers that, that I had an opportunity to uh, talk with afterwards. And I wanted to share their stories with you because I think it's very pertinent as we talk about what this little Facebook Live is, video is titled, which is Homelessness Housing and uh, the Illinois budget. Um, there's a lot of interaction. So before we get to the, the, the summation, I, I wanna start with our, uh, the first person I have is this young gentleman sit, seated here next to me. This is Mr. Isaac Strain. And he has a fascinating story. Um, and, and before I give away any details, I'm just gonna go ahead and let Isaac uh, tell his story. And, and uh, I guess I'll give away the, the as an intro, as a way of an intro, I'll, I'll give away the first tidbit, but you were homeless. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, homeless five years ago today, actually. It would have been, uh, uh, started in November five years ago, and then uh, it was for uh, uh, the majority of my senior year of high school, yeah. Homeless for the majority of, so you were a, a student. Yes, I was a student at the Senior time. in high school, and you were homeless. Yep. So, um, that in and itself, itself is, I, I don't know anyone that that wouldn't strike a chord in their heart and say, oh my gosh, wow, that's, you know, because most people, thankfully, we don't have to deal with this, but your story's fascinating, um, and, and and I want you to just go ahead and tell everybody about it, so please go ahead yeah, and tell your story. Thank you, Representative Martwick. Um, so my name is Isaac Strain. I'm a senior in chemical engineering at the University of Illinois, um, and I'm a former homeless independent youth, um, and I want to give you some context as to the implications of, you know, what it was like for me uh, and, and what it means for other uh, homeless students who are now in the same situation as I am. Um, like I said, this time, five years ago today, uh, I w had gone through a second home foreclosure and it resulted in me uh, uh, not having anywhere to stay. So I lived in my old foreclosed home um, until the banks changed the locks and then I was living in my car. Um, and you know, during this time, I was still attending school, I had two jobs, um, but I eventually reached a critical point where it was very difficult you know, it's, it's cold outside and, you know, living in my car was uh, uh, very uncomfortable. And so I eventually reached out to someone in my school to let them know what was going on. And uh, though they cared and they, they wanted to help, uh, the advice they gave me was to, you know, find some extended family. I had extended family in Indiana. They said, maybe try going out there and, you know, staying with them and, and finishing school there. Uh, they they, they kind of gave me just some ad hoc advice, no real direction. Um, and so, you know, I continued to live in my car and tried to make ends meet until eventually my car uh, broke down and I could no longer drive to school. And uh, unfortunately, because I wasn't identified uh, as homeless by district liaison, um, I couldn't uh, take uh, the bus to school because I didn't have a home address. I couldn't, uh, for instance, go and use the library computers because to get a library card, you have to have an address. Um, I was pretty limited in terms of what I was capable of doing. I, I mean, I couldn't even sign my own permission slips. Something that you don't think about is, you know, a teacher sends home, hey, um, you need to have this permission slip signed to, to get something done, and my teachers wondered why I wasn't, uh, you know, my line of sight at the time. Um, luckily, uh, right about this time, I, I had not been going to school for a bit, um, I came back one day and someone who was aware of resources at my school got me set up with what's called a district liaison to identify me as homeless. Um, and this was really big for me. Once I got 
identified as homeless. Uh, this liaison helped me apply for SNAP benefits, uh, helped me get a temporary address with the school so that I could take the bus from any of the bus stops. Um, and you know, the really big thing was she told me, hey, you know, we can get you school lunches paid for, which that's one of my meals taken care of. And she said, we even can get you to apply to college. We can waive the application fees because there's resources available for you. Um, so what she did was by getting identified as homeless, I got, it wasn't that I got a, a check with you know, the $100,000 to get me on my situation, but what it was is it gave me tools and resources so that I could get myself out of my situation. Um, and you know the, the, the moral of the story is I, I got applied to college, I got my fees waived, I got a full ride to University of Illinois. I'm now graduating as a chemical engineer um, from one of the best chemical engineering schools in the world. Mm -hmm. I have a full-time job lined up, so I'm gonna be a producing member of society. I'm a published scientist, and you know, had I not been identified as homeless, had I not uh, gotten linked with these resources, I definitely, I would not be here today. And you know what's unfortunate, um, Rob, is that I have other friends who also were homeless at my same school who didn't get identified as homeless, who, you know, I, it took me two months before I got identified. And these other students, these friends of mine, they never got identified and they dropped out. They moved to, you know, North Dakota to try to find work during the fracking boom. And now they don't have high school diplomas. They're hopping from place to place, just trying to make ends meet. And now they're a big cost to society and they're in a horrible situation and it all could have been prevented had they been identified early so but it's a r really tremendous story and you know the thing that struck me um of course the first thing is to hear and, and you know what happens but you know realistically to, when you see someone it, it, it's a different level right? yeah and you hear about it, it's one thing when you see somebody you say i was homeless my senior year in high school you're like oh my god i mean i you know, that's not something I ever had to deal with. It's not a challenge I had in my life. And, and so it, it really strikes me. You know, but, the other thing is there's families out there who, who we interact with and people who are going through that situation who you have no idea about this. So right. you might be a constituent or, or a person who thinks like this isn't applicable to me, but you might not know that your friend or your neighbor is, is going through this right now. So. People we know in our neighborhood, did, our, our, our children may be going to school with students who are going through the same thing you were going through and they may come over to your house and play or whatever yeah. and you have no idea that they're suffering through these problems. So that, that struck me. The other thing that struck me was, um, and it's something that I hadn't contemplated, was the challenge you talked about when you become homeless. How it's, it's, it's not just the fact that you don't have a home, but it's the fact that your access to just about everything in life disappears because you don't have an address. Yeah. And, and you even told me that you applied to that factory, I think you mentioned this yeah. before, you applied to the factory for a job and you were like, all right, I'll go get a job. But you weren't even hired by them because of the fact that you become high risk because you don't have an address. Yeah, I got to the final interview and I was told, you know, you have all the skills we need, this is great. And they said, you know, the only thing that we're having issue with is your home address, you, you know, you, you didn't put a home address down. And I explained, hey, you know, I don't have a, a current mailing address right now. Um, and they said, you know, that, that puts you at too high of risk, we can't hire you. And so it's not that I didn't want to pull myself up by the bootstraps, it's that I wasn't even given the chance to. Right, so, right, like you, you, you go from having opportunities to those opportunities, all those doors start slamming on you. At the you worst time. Yeah, yes. at the worst time. And, and so that, that's fascinating to me. Your story is fascinating to me because, again, it shows that and, and especially you giving the example of your friend, and we're not going to mention his name, but you mentioned that he got a 31 on his ACT, yeah. right? A 31 on his ACT. That is no small feat. That yeah. is showing exceptional ability. And yet, you were given opportunities because you were identified, because he wasn't, he wasn't given those opportunities. His life has taken a very different trajectory very different than yours. And, and the other thing that you talked about was having these, once you're identified, having these services made available to you, again, as you, the way you put it was, no one handed me a check. What they did was they gave me tools so that I could take advantage of opportunities that existed. And exactly. you took those opportunities, you turned them into a, a, a college degree at one of the finest universities in the country. Um, you're gonna go on and be a productive uh, citizen, have a productive life. I think that's wonderful. And, and this, brings us back to the point of this video that we talked about, which was, in order to do this, we have to invest 
in these services, yeah. right? Once we identify you, we have to be able to provide those tools that you can take advantage of. And um, one of my greatest sources of frustration during our two and a half budget year, uh, two and a half year budget impasse, um, was that we made cuts to programs like the ones that provided opportunity for you. So that was five years ago. Yeah. But over the course of the last two and a half years, we made devastating cuts to these programs. And um, I have met in Springfield other homeless students uh, who have come and spoken to me about the necessity of programs like yours, and yet they were always on the chopping block. Yep. And so when we talk about that, when you're in a budget crisis, you have to decide on how you solve your budget. And I get it. People say, uh, I don't want any more taxes. I understand that. I, I totally get that that's their point. I don't want to pay any more taxes. But in order to balance the budget without the tax increase, we start making cuts to programs like the ones that served you. And the argument that I make often is that those are short-sighted cuts because while they allow us to balance the budget today, two years, the societal years, cost is, is exponentially yes. higher mm -hmm. and that cost goes back to all of us. So what we say in the short term creates excessive cost in the long term. So I'm going to turn right now to someone who can speak exactly about that. Uh, Rachel Contos is with the Alliance Ten Homelessness, and she um, told me about a specific instance where she actually dealt with this situation. And so could you repeat yeah. what you told me? So, so thank you, Rachel. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me and to everyone watching or who will watch as well. Um, so in our conversation, we were talking about what is the cost of actually ending homelessness for someone and how that actually saves money in the long run. So for example, we were just looking at partnerships with um, the health system and other kind of emergency services, and it could cost uh, 30 to 40, even more, $1,000 to basically keep someone homeless, um, and that's just in emergency services like the hospital system. And we even had an instance where someone was cycling in and out of the hospital system, costing about $50,000 a year. Um, if if we can actually find that person and house them, and right, and that takes that investment in that housing with support, we can actually spend less than that 50,000 number and end up saving money. So what does that do? A, it saves money, right? So instead of spending $50,000 to intentionally keep someone homeless, we're actually helping to, we're, we're housing them and we're spending less money. That's less on the taxpayer in the long run and a better outcome. Um, so one, another story I can share too is that a lot of times when people get into permanent supportive housing, um, a program that often can get cut, they can actually, these supports can help them be self-sustaining. So we just had someone um, who I, I interviewed who was in permanent supportive housing. After a few years of having those supports, was able to move um, on out of that housing and be on uh, in their own housing. And because of that opportunity, was able to gain custody of his sister's uh, children and move to housing in a place where the kids are in a great school district. They're um, in clubs, they love their teachers. They feel safe when they walk outside. That's all because this person got the chance to get into supportive housing. Um, we invested in that supportive housing. After a few years, he was fine. And now he has a family and a community that he's safe in. Um, and all of that was cheaper than letting him stay homeless. So I think that's fascinating, right? Whatever people's motivations are when we come to make these decisions, the bottom line is there's a moral component mm -hmm. and there's a financial component. When the two align and you can do the right thing and save money for the government, and who's the government? We're the government, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, the taxpayers, it's, it's by, of the people, by the people, for the people, it's our government. Um, so when we can do that, you know, this is the sort of stuff that we need to drop the politics, focus on the math, math, you know a little bit about math, and, yeah. and, and, and say, hey, we can accomplish the right thing and put our state in better financial footing in the future. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Up to $50,000 a year to keep someone homeless. And my guess is that's perpetuating. As long as they stay homeless, they'll continue to cycle oh, in and yeah. out. Mm -hmm. That's $50,000 a year forever. 
as opposed to, you mentioned a, a number, $10,000 a year for permanent supportive housing, but often that leads to, for a couple of years, a much lower one-fifth the cost for a couple of years, that leads to positive outcomes. And, and Isaac is, is a perfect example. He got yeah. temporary help, and he has a permanent solution that's not gonna cost us money. It's going to make us money because he's yeah. going to be a productive, tax-paying member of our society, and best yet, we get the satisfaction of knowing that we, as a society, as a government, as a community, as a people, we said, hey, even though you're down on your luck, we believe in you, and we're gonna invest in you, and look at the dividends that it's paid. So um, this is the sort of stuff that we deal with, and it's the sort of stuff that I learned about, it's the sort of stuff that I wanna share with you, the viewer. Any last comments before we sum it up here? Yeah, I think you know one of the most, ex no, most people aren't excited to pay their taxes, uh, but I'm really excited because the first job I have lined up uh, starting in August, the taxes I'll pay within the first year are more than enough to have covered the investment that was put into me to get me there, so I'm, I'm actually excited to pay That's taxes. Awesome. Um, you know, after the first year, I'm sure I won't be, but you right, know, right. Well, yeah, but you know, it's a good start. So. Exactly. No, that's that's great. That's wonderful. That's a great little summation. Uh, any last thoughts? Oh, I can't follow. Up. <laughs> no. Thank you all, um, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, as always, uh, State Representative Robert Martwick, feel free to comment on this video. Reach out to me, repmartwick at gmail .com or uh, repmartwick.com, uh, you can find me there. Reach out to my office, 773-286-1115. Uh, We're happy to work with you, happy to take your comments, your criticisms, your complaints. Um, uh, reach out, get involved, uh, we can do good things together. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank See you, you next much. time. Thank you.